The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor Thomas Goss, back on the job with the last stretch of evaluations for the 2020 orchestration challenge. So apologies for people who've been waiting a bit. Uh, I did say that I was going to try to wrap things up by the end of last month, but I just really decided that I needed a bit of a break, not to talk too much about other projects that I might be working on, but it's not that so much. It's more that um, I, I really want my style, my quality of evaluation to be as fresh as possible and to not just, con you know, not to start um, falling back on sort of the same strategies for evaluating things. I'd really like each evaluation to have its own rhythm and its own logic and and to really treat each person as an individual um, in this process rather than just sort of see th seeing things as a, as a sea of scores to look at. So um, I don't think I ever got to that point up to this point um, after I passed the 100 mark. There are about 38 or 39 more scores. I think there is one score that uh, may have been lost in the shuffle and I'm going to try to dig that up to make sure that that entrant does not get um, does not get left out. However, um, just to let everybody know I'm going to start now and hopefully I'll be finished by my birthday on the 15th of July. So uh, wish me luck on that. The 15th of July uh, sort of Pacific Standard Time as uh, I'm a day ahead of um, most of the Western Hemisphere and Europe and Africa. So let's start with this really beautiful entry from Chicago. And yeah, I mean, there are a lot of things that are great about it. There are a lot of things that are a little difficult, a little clumsy, perhaps, in, in real practice. Um, and there are some things that just, you know, just require a little bit more information in terms of, you know, learning how to use the, um, the resources of each instrument. All right, so let's start off with the, uh, with the treatment of the melody on this first page. And I, I really like this, ba -da -da -dum, in English horn. And notice that this is sounding an octave lower than the register of the melody as it is in the piano part. And I feel that's very, very strong. It's, um, it's not necessary to always leave things in the same register as a piano when you're transcribing or score, or scoring, uh, adapting, I should say, in orchestral scoring. And so we've got ba da 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 in the English horn, and then the same exact register. So notice, like transposing up a perfect fifth is how you write English horn parts, right? And so this the actual 
pitch here is the same uh, starting pitch as in Atu Bassoons. Now, here I would say there's really no need for you to um, to write A2 here, okay? And you don't have to write A period 2, right? The actual, um, you could do 2 period if you want to uh, include a period, but it's just, it's easier just to go because like there's, there's nothing uh, being abbreviated when you use the letter A. It's just the French word for with, right? So with 2 is, and if you're, and actually, yeah, so, um, so I would just say, you know, A2 is, is good enough. Um, and here, you don't have to say first only or third only or whatever, just have the number one, right? So here's what that should look like. One period, right? So that's much more, that's much cleaner. It's easier to read, easier to look at. And, um, and yeah, so, so we'll, I'll, I'll discuss the treatment of the melody first, but there are a few other little scoring things that I think we could focus on, but let's not get sidetracked. So, ba da 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 dum Right, and now the uh, piccolo takes over, right, and we've got other instruments coming in. ba da da bum ba bum And I really like the way that you spread things out across <clears throat> the different um, the different groups, the different sections. Okay, um, there are a few problems with it though, all right? So you're keeping everybody soft and you've got piccolo up here, but I would say in this register, like the, the piccolo is going to have a kind of a folk flute type character to it, right? And just very, very easily overwhelmed by other things. The piccolo doesn't really start to shine and start to speak out until around here f sharp g natural okay so so really um the danger here is that all the other elements around it are going to overwhelm it right we've got um you've got sort of tracking from below the same pitches uh an octave below on trumpet okay and the danger here is that the and once again all you need to do is just write um Sorry, one period. All right, keeps wanting to crawl up my screen. I'm not. I don't know why. Anyhow, um, so the the danger here is that the overtones from the trumpet are going to sort of speak out and and cover the um, the piccolo uh, an octave higher, right? Okay, so I'm going to come back to the melody, but let's talk about a few things here. All right, now you translated the original um, Ase Vit as fast enough, okay? So, but Ase's, or Ase, there's, you don't pronounce the Z, is, it doesn't mean enough. I mean, it, it, okay, it means enough in, the, in a certain context in French, but what it really means is quite. So the actual translation is quite fast, right? So it would really be better for you to use the French um, the uh, French language tempo marks, even if you are scoring everything in English, obviously, if you're writing um, things like third only and so on. And if you're using English as your basic, um, your basic language for the score, that is totally fine, but it's also fine for you to mix languages. If you're doing a transcription of a French piece, uh, it is perfectly all right for you to be uh, writing, you know, assez vite. It's totally fine, okay? So do not worry about that. Now I'm gonna teach you something else here. Now I'm noticing all of your uh, tempo, or excuse me, all of your um, dynamic markings here are all written in, I think it's called plantain okay, is the name of the font, okay? So you are just missing something out here, okay? So let's say that you wanted to type mezzo forte, all right? So in order to do that, you are going to have to use Control e or Command e um, if you're in Mac, okay? But here's the trick, all right? I'm just gonna leave my thumb sitting 
on the command or control key. Now I'm just going to type MF and then escape. Right? See, so, so what you're doing by not doing that, see, what you're doing is you're just going, you're just going command E or control E and then you're typing MF and then going on with your business, right? So just leave your thumb sitting on that command or control key as you type the other things, right? So once again, so I'm on a Mac, so I'm using command. So command E and I'm leaving my thumb on that key. And then with my other fingers, I am typing MF. Okay, so that is like the easiest, um, that is the easiest uh, shortcut, keyboard shortcut in Sibelius that there is. All right, so you should definitely be learning that. Just train yourself to do that. Go, I don't know, just for an exercise, go over this entire, um, this entire score and um, replace all of your, uh, all of your dynamic marks, just to kind of get into the hang of it, so your thumb knows where to sit. Okay. All right. Now let's talk a little bit about the, the other elements that we've got in here. So there's nothing wrong with this back and forth kind of stuff here in the clarinets. This is all going to work very well in your uh, violins. And here it's interesting that you spell out, you know, piano crescendo, piano crescendo, piano crescendo to mezzo forte, piano crescendo to forte. Okay, so that gives you a kind of a surging sort of a sound, right? Um, and look, if that's what you want there, I'm not going to critique it. That's totally fine with me. Um, but let's go back to this whole idea here. Okay, so, so here you are going back and forth between low B and E. And then, now, just to let you know, that's fine, okay? But I'm pointing it out because I want you to think about that low B and just be careful when you are doing any kind of alternating, like slurring, um, in order to uh, trill between like say a B and a C or a B and a C sharp, um, the, the little finger has to kind of go back and forth between these little rolling pads and it is not very fast at all. Now here, this is a very slow uh, measured alternating note, so it's not a huge deal, but it's not as smooth as you might think. Fortunately, everything is soft, but I would say if you ever had to score something down there on B and you had something like this and it had to be very loud and uh, exposed, I would say think of a different instrument to do it, possibly clarinet or some other kind of, you know, in, in that particular register that's smoother. Okay, so uh, the big problem here is this right here. Okay, so you are basically, you are basically telling us by this notation that you intend bisbigliando, okay? Bisbigliando cannot play like that, okay? Um, you can have, you, first you have to, you have to mark it bis, B-I-S-B, period, and you can never really get above piano, okay? So like here you're going up to mezzo piano, that's still too loud. This bigliando is a pianissimo effect, okay? And it really should only be used when the music is incredibly delicate. When, and even when it is incredibly delicate, you can barely hear it because what does the word in Italian, bisbigliando mean? It means whispering, right? So don't use bisbigliando unless you, unless the music is just absolutely just soft and, and delicate and, you know, okay, so an example. Go and score read. Um, the, probably the most famous example of bisbigliando is in, um, is in Neptune. Okay, and you can listen to many recordings of it, and when it starts, you will barely hear it. You'll just hear this kind of weird, tinkly background. It almost sounds like uh, wind chimes, uh, be, you know, behind a closed door. Okay, so that is as big as you are ever going to get with Bisbigliando. So here, I don't really feel it adds anything to the music. I think, you know, if you were to cut out everything, all of these crescendos, and by the way, if you have looked at some of my other evaluations, you will know that I have um, I have warned people that just because the melody has some crescendo over it doesn't mean 
that the accompaniment is intended to surge, right? Because it's just it's just one chord with a single change to it, right? So that doesn't necessarily imply that the um, that the accompaniment is also meant to surge, all right? Like especially with the timpani. So if you have this rolling timpani getting louder, there is no way to hear bisbigliando in your harp. The other thing is like I would say just you know put a slur over it so it's just sort of intended to kind of be one combined thing um usually bisbigliando is the most effective when it is two chords that are inharmonically tuned to be the t same pitches that way the strings are alternating back and forth so that they don't just immediately s get stomped all right okay so um other than those big caveats, those just really were things I felt you should um, should think about. It's pretty well done. Now here, um, there's really no reason for this to be the third horn versus the second horn. It's like here you're having the horns play um, play this right in here, and they're obviously meant to meant to tune to each other, right? So this is good scoring. So. If there's no reason for this to be anything other than the second horn, then the same thing is true here. The same thing applies because you want both of these players to just completely be listening to each other. Now the third horn player will do a good job, and they're but they are sitting one seat to um, they're sitting one they're sitting one seat away. I'm, I was thinking like to the right or to the left, depending on how you're looking at them. If the the horn player will be the the third horn player will be sitting two chairs from the first horn player's right. So, um, yeah, so the third will be uh, two chairs to the right. And so the second horn player really is able to play these kind of very beautifully controlled, intimate kinds of um, kinds of harmonies, right? So it's better to use them. Now here, um, just to, I think I got a little distracted, but I, what I meant to tell you was that if you are having like solos like this, just have a, have a single horn and have the second horn come in here on harmony. Because um, I, I would say above F or F sharp in um, in the bassoon's range, then you should really, you know, if you're having any kind of intimate soloing going on, it should absolutely be a single bassoon, right? The higher you get, the more you, more you run into kind of a problematic thing. Look, you would not have two English horn players playing this, right? Well, the bassoon in this register is just as special, just as expressive, just as unique individual as the English horn. So there's absolutely zero reason for you to pair up the um, this line here, these four notes, on two bassoons, right? Just have a single bassoon. That is that voice in the darkness is really what you want, isn't it? All right, just as as the uh, the sunlight grows outside of um, outside of Lily's curtains, right? So that you can see that you know, after maybe weeks of rain, it's going to be a beautiful day, and she's feeling good too, right? Now here you have a lot of glissandos. Okay, so these are rips. So um, uh, if you have read um, the, uh, my uh, my tip in. 100 orchestra 100 more orchestration tips I talk about like the the you know how far glissandos can go with um, with brass instruments and you know you have to understand it is a very big exaggerated effect you know Brah! you know I mean it's just really um, you're taking away the beautiful delicacy of everything else that's happening here with this kind of trumpet like or sorry, excuse me, this kind of um, elephant-like trumpeting, right? And it's just like, Bring! it's really, you know, it just it just it has very little delicacy to it. Um, and then later on, you have some glissandos that are very close together, and that really doesn't make any sense. It's better just to write out notes in between, you know, like a, a like a little chromatic riff, um, because there's, there's almost no distance. So yeah, go read that tip and 100 more orchestration tips. I don't have the book out in front of me right now. I'm a little less prepared uh, as I'm kind of getting back into these things. I should really have like four or five screens um, uh, or two different systems, you know, just when I'm doing these evaluations so I can check different uh, sources on things and quickly give people answers, but it's all right. Just go check out the glissando, the brass glissando um, uh, tip in 100 more orchestration tips. 
Okay, and I like this little piccolo trill. That's nice, and this cascading stuff. It would have been really great to see what your take was on the um, on like the whole piece if you had decided to support on Patreon and and done an entire um, done like a, a had done an entry that was the entire piece. Okay, so we're kind of fluttering away here, and it's you're ending on a very soft. I'm assuming very soft high F sharp that's okay um, uh, but this is a little less uh, likely here you have pianissimo on this high F sharp and just to let you know that like above E piccolo just becomes more radiant and it sort of stands out more and becomes just really kind of uh, really tends to project even when it's playing softly right and then here you've got your oboe going all the way up to high F sharp and this is an extremely thin strained sound up there it's just not beautiful at all right here you have three clarinets sitting on this low written uh, C sharp okay and that is going to be kind of foghorn like so I think you have your priorities sort of mixed up here um, a clarinet could probably play this better uh, or you know maybe have the clarinets fluttering around and have your um, have your flutes cover some of these same notes but I, I just I just feel there is there is still a lot of of work that needs to be done here okay and then here you have mezzo forte down to pianissimo I like the fact that you have a destination dynamic that should be in all parts okay and including here right what how low do you want them to go all right um, it's a bit dangerous here to score mezzo forte for your horns right and mezzo piano for your winds it should be the other way around right or it should be you know even piano for your brass and then mezzo forte for your winds or something but you know just just really try to balance things a little bit more uh more like you are um that there is an overall dynamic and then score the instruments to that dynamic that balance well within that dynamic and then you don't need to do this kind of dynamic mixing where you have some brass instruments mezzo piano, some of the mezzo forte. You've got a cymbal part that's piano and and mezzo. I mean, how does a conductor work with that? You have to think. You know how. You know, I mean, are they going to be able to stop the rehearsal and say, "Okay, you guys, um, your mezzo piano is too loud. The pe the person sitting next to you is playing mezzo forte, not mezzo piano. You know, stop trying to play as loud as them." And so, I mean, it just ends up with a big mess. So instead of that. Just really, you know, try to um, try to have a more unified dynamic. Um, if you have to do any kind of mixing or balancing, it should be this that you know, in a texture like this where it's very soft and unified. If you want everything to balance perfectly, you should have your winds and strings about the same dynamic, and then you have you should have your brass one dynamic level under. Okay, so it would be better for this all to be winds and strings, mezzo forte, and then your brass piano or mezzo piano okay and maybe piano would be better just just to get the tone really delicate and then diminuendo to pianissimo um and then just have your strings and winds diminuendo to piano and just have it unified like tell everybody right the same thing okay um all right so so moving on <laughs> um glissando to where Right, it's like it's just like you're sort of saying, oh well, you know, just just in this, you know, if you really want this chord to glissando, you have to have a glissando line on every note of the chord. But look, have a destination, you know, tell the harpist how far you want to go to. Now, this was recently covered, I think, a day or two ago. Uh, somebody had submitted a an example of harp writing and said, you know, is this too? Um, you know, it's what are some what's some feedback? And my first comment was that it was sort of pianistic. You know, it's 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 safer to think of harp scoring more as like a kind of a big guitar or a two-handed guitar with no frets, right? Um, than it is to think of it as a kind of a piano that you can that's plucked, right? So it just is works way better that way. So there's nothing wrong with your harp scoring. But my second comment here, what? in that, and this is something I've mentioned before, is that don't use the upward roll, right? The upward roll is telling the player, look, there's a downward roll somewhere in here, 
right? And then they'll look through their part for the downward roll just to be on the safe side. You don't really mean this though. This is what you mean. Hang on. Let me get my keypad back here. You know, this is what you mean. Right? That is that is the um, that is the default, and there is absolutely nothing wrong with sticking to the default. So just use the default, right? Um, there, there's really no need. Like the upward arrow is there to tell the player, okay, this is going to be the normal way of doing it. The downward arrow is sort of like an alternate. It's like, okay, now roll downwards, right? So you, you just barely do not even need this this upward arrow. I mean. 0.05% of the time, okay? So everybody, please, please, I hope that there are like a thousand people who are going to watch this evaluation here. Um, I really, really want people to stop using upward rolls when they just mean the default roll mark, okay? Just stop it, cut it out. Same thing goes for Celesta players, right? If I were playing orchestral piano, which I did a couple for a couple of rehearsals, I was never a I was never an orchestral pianist, but I did occasionally help out with like in kind of um, semi-pro situations. And once once I played uh, the piano part when one of my works was being read that had a piano part or a keyboard part. Uh, look, just don't put up arrow rolls on things, okay? The roll mark always means upward roll. All right, so that should be the 99% th way that you use it, okay? All right. Okay, so, um, and same thing here. Look, just, you know, it's a keyboard part. You're using a grand staff. You just put that pianissimo mark right there, okay? Now, make sure, let's get that keypad back. Make sure that your dynamics, when you have any kind of grand staff scoring, always make sure that it is set to all, okay? Rather than first voice because when you have it set to first voice, it will only apply to the uh, staff, right? So so in this part right here, you might've heard in the mock-up, you could barely hear the left hand. You could just only hear this this upper roll here. And that's because, because of this pianissimo mark under the staff being set to voice one, um, it's still applied to this. So the piano mark applied to this, right? But were this piano mark to have been marked all, then that would have solved the problem immediately. Okay, so that's really has nothing to do with scoring. It's more of a way that Sibelius works. But anyway, so just watch out, okay? I really liked the scoring right in here, by the way. The combination of Glock and Celesta, really nice. I like the harp right in here. Um, I didn't really see a whole lot wrong with the way that the rest of this was scored. Uh, I think I think I, I've seen something by you before. Um, I can't recall whether you posted something um, or you asked my advice on something or there was something in the um, in the uh, um, in the group. But anyhow, this this is this is some nice stuff in here. I I like this. Um, I think it's done pretty well. Yeah, I just yeah da 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 bum 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 bum. We don't have that inner melody, but I'll I'll give you a pass on that. A lot of people miss that. Um, and you know the little call and response, that's great. Okay, so be aware, Colenio. Okay, you don't need to to mark. Um, you do not need to mark staccato marks. It's just you know, um, maybe mark Colenio Batuto or uh, trato, okay? So trato is when people actually bow, you know. Everybody thinks colenio means colenio batuto, which is you, you sort of beat the back of the bow um, on the uh, on the string. But here, like, you know, you have it marked mezzo forte. You could mark it fortissimo, and it would still not sound as loud as your flutes and especially brass, right? If you wanted this to balance, you'd have to mark this fortissimo, and you have to mark this stuff pianissimo, right? Because Batuto is just such a soft effect. You would be better off with pizzicato here if you wanted a quality of string tone to be part of the staccato you've got in the other instruments. But I mean, I just you know you can leave it the way that it is, and just find out for yourself. 
that Colenio Batuto is a soft, soft, soft sound. Okay. Um, and here, I, I, you know, brackets or not, you should say norm when you mean for the Colenio to end. All right. So it should right from there. It should say norm. Or maybe you intended. It's like strange. It's like here you're saying bracket ends here, and then you have this, and then you have arco here. Did you mean arco to be there? There's like no way to make a Colenio Batuto sound last. A Colenio Trato, right? You could say Colenio Batuto and then Trato, right? Which is a little louder. I think you intended for arco to be right here. Anyway, and this is all fine. You really can barely hear the strings right in here, and that's because the brass and winds are working so richly together. If you want this to balance, mark the strings forte, okay? And mark the upper, I would say, mark the winds forte as well, and then just leave the brass at mezzo forte. Now, yeah, so here you have glissandos that are like, you know, they're only apart by a, you know, a, um, a, an augmented, for, or excuse me, a diminished fourth. Or no, that's a perfect fourth, sorry. So, yeah, you, it's just really not that. And then here you've got an A up to a C sharp, right? Or a C natural. Or, I don't know. It's like one is one is sharp and one is natural. Um, yeah, so, and here you've got like a D natural glissandoing up to an F, F sharp. So, look, I mean, it's just better to have little, just to write out the notes that you intend them to play over, right? and then just do that when you have the notes so close together but you know just be and also be being aware that glissando up on a on a diminuendo is difficult okay uh, especially like a really big one like like going up from this c natural up to that f natural it's just like it's something that horn players especially don't like to do because it's you know their entire job is all about finesse and everything else and and it's just kind of a crude effect to a lot of them you know i mean they'll do it but they just kind of like you know it kind of it it eats away at their self-esteem <laughs> okay to have too many glissandos for the wrong reason okay all right so um i think i kind of this first evaluation here is about two times as long as I normally would go. It's like half an hour long already. So I'm going to stop now, but I hope that I gave you enough um, enough of a feedback. Okay, I don't under understand. I don't understand staccato tie, staccato on a bass drum. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, you know, it would be better just to get rid of the staccato, get rid of the tie, get rid of this bar, and just have a single note pianissimo. Okay? That's... Because I mean, bass drum staccato. It's it's it would be better just to write out the the length of note you want, like like write in an eighth note, and then and then you know you could damp it there, right? But this kind of doesn't make any sense. You know, you want do you want thump thump? Then just don't get rid of the tie, right? It doesn't it doesn't work that way. Okay, um, alrighty. So yeah I really enjoyed this score and I, I think I'm gonna to have to rein in my exuberance here to be back in the saddle um, evaluating scores just really really fun and and you know I get a lot of enjoyment out of it but like I said I think if I do too many in a row I'm I am in the in danger I feel the danger of being repetitive and um, and starting to repeat myself and and failing to look at each score individually. So I would like to think that I haven't done that yet and that I have tried to look at each score on its own individual merits. And that was part of what my break was about, was to just keep that from starting. So anyways, really great score. Just just learn more about Glissando, okay? I feel that your that your information about Glissando is not quite is not quite complete. Okay? So read some of the tips in my books about glissando, do some score reading, maybe talk to some brass players about what glissando sounds like, okay, and just really see if you're satisfied with that. And for all I know, you're a brass player and you're just saying, oh, shut up, Thomas. Uh, it's fine with me. I have no problem reading that or playing that, in which case I apologize. Okay, so on to the next score, and thank you so much uh, for your entry to this challenge.
All right, another great score. Uh, thank you so much, Anthony, for the beautiful simplicity of this entry. I, I feel that it is just, um, I mean, it's not so much that it has, uh, you know, obviously compared to the score we just looked at, it is very straightforward. There's not a lot of, um, you know, not, not a lot of icing and not a lot of uh, like figuration and, and other kinds of elements. Um, but it's, it's also that it's just very nicely devised, right? So I'm just hoping I can help you with a few, um, you know, with a, with a few different uh, things. Okay, here I would actually um, score this uh, in second voice, right? I think that the appropriate way to deal with this, uh, hang on, let me get the keypad out. Okay, it is like this, right? And then, of course, this could just be. Hang on. Oops. Change that to second voice, and of course, change that to a. Uh... All right. Okay, see, so that's way, way clearer. Okay. And then you don't even need the number. Boom. All right, and yeah, just. It looks like you did some copy pasting and changing around of certain things and uh, yeah. Okay, so there's a couple things in here. You know, one is that like you got these trumpets sitting around doing nothing and then you've got your first horn playing this really high E to D. Uh, um, you know what I mean? That That's possible, but is it possible at triple P? You know what I mean? It's like, what does triple P mean to a hornist who's playing that E and D? Now, it's it's possible to get a very, very fine sound out of that, but it's so much easier for a trumpet to play incredibly softly um, on the same pitches, which with B-flat trumpets would be, um, I guess you're trying to play... Uh, concert A, so they would read it as a B, right? So playing B and and then uh, A themselves, right? So um, that that's really really simple. Um, very, it's it possible to get it just to the finest uh, triple P that you could possibly want. Where I'm a little dubious, like this note is going to shine, right? Here you want it to be doubling the second violins, right? So um, maybe it would be better to have like your second uh, oboe player cover that, right? Or one of your clarinetists cover that same pitch just to get the just to get the softest kind of sound. Now you are doing a lot of things right here in terms of balance, right? Like you have got your horns just way in the background, and you've got your uh, you've got your strings at piano and clarinet and so on and so forth. That is great. That is all fine. I really, really like it. Um, yeah, just I think if you're going to write flute, oboe, clarinet, just write bassoon instead of basson. Okay, and then yeah, so we've got a pretty good balance here. I think you could even write forte for the harp. Now this chord is wrong. Like you should check it out. It's like it it it's it suggests downward motion in the harmony, which it isn't. All right. Um, I will say no more. You can go look that up yourself. Okay, um, and then here you're balancing your um, your brass against the strings, right? And it's just really such a big sound. So the only thing I would say is like, do you really want that kind of ferocious response to the bum 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 bum? Right. Um, and just a tiny bit of a nitpicking kind of a thing, and that is. If you could have a little bit of diminuendo right at the end of this bar, then you can go ahead into the pianissimo and piano um, of the of the next bar without worrying about this mezzo forte washing over and and sort of obscuring the beauty of the downbeat. Right? That's you just really have to watch out for that. If you have something loud and then the first beat of the next bar is soft, 
right? Then you really want that's that's where diminuendo is so useful, and it has to go beyond just note shaping because the players have got to bring it down, right? So that the next beat is is very very clear, right? Now the way that you scored it here, not so clear, especially as you've got like this C sharp here in the oboe. Notice how it's marked red. So they're trying to they're sort of trying to say, well, you know. It's not going to be the most beautiful note, or it's going to be a little out of range for maybe a, a like a amateur player or something, or a student player, or not going to be the greatest note. Um, I, I would say like don't worry about that so much. I am not that concerned about that. I am more concerned that you're slurring into a tenuto, right? So you're going, bum, right? So like, so the player is going to play this as a full blocky chunk, right? So most when you look at note shaping, you see you sort of see the attack. It's sort of kind of like a spike, and then you will see this lovely kind of curve as the player brings the note to a stop. But when you have a uh, a tenuto mark, when you look at a wind or string player, they just have like this big block. It just like starts and it stays, and then it lets go, right? So what that's all the more reason not either don't have a tenuto there or do have the tenuto, and have the um have the um, diminuendo. Okay, now there's another problem here. Okay, sometimes you're slurring into the tenuto mark, sometimes you're not. Okay, well, the way to do it is to not slur into it, right? Because, a, you know, for a string player, it is a sort of a, kind of makes a zoom sound, right? So it's like, it's the bow is moving quickly and fully over the note, and you're using the entire bow for the entire length of the of the note when you are writing tenuto, right? So that's the technique. Okay. Um, now it's a bit different for for wind players, right? You know, it's not as big of a crisis for them to have a slur going into. You know, I mean, the bow the bow is already half used by the time that they get to here, right? So like, it just it's better to do this. Okay, but with them, it's just like how can they shape? the note individually to have that blocky thing when they're slurring into it, right? So it just doesn't make any sense. Now, it I mean, here you seem to kind of imply like a kind of portato, right? But that's a different thing. Um, now, you do not need to, to slur um, tenuto staccato, okay? Don't do that because tenuto staccato is like a, um, is kind of an unga, sort of like unga, 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 unga. Right? That's kind of what we're getting here, right? So how do you slur that together? It's, it doesn't make any sense. So just get rid of the, you know, get rid of the slur mark there. Same thing here, right? Um, so those are some delicate things for you to think about. There's really nothing all that wrong with any of this. I mean, it's really nicely done, I thought. Um, I like the way that things trade off, you know, from A clarinet to oboe. Um, and the only thing I would say is like, do you really need the accompaniment to surge? Go look at the piano part again. What is really surging in those first two bars? It's the melody, right? Da 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 da. What is the change in the chord that you could possibly apply any more force to? It's this note, right? Going from B to A sharp. Okay, so you know, does the does she intend? Does the piano part surge in that? You, you know, if you were playing that on piano, you wouldn't make that F sharp suddenly, or the, excuse me, that A sharp suddenly stand out strongly, would you? No, of course not. So why should the accompaniment surge, right? So I'm not, I'm not saying that it's right or wrong to do it. I'm just saying just you know, like think about why it is scored the way that it is. This is lovely, by the way. This is as low as you could possibly go, and it will it will barely form a um, uh, a harmonic. It would be better, you know, if you really want this to be to be heard. It would be better to just write it up an octave without the harmonic, right? If that's what you intend. Now, if you actually intended this pitch, right? If you intended it to sound this pitch and be plucked an octave lower so that you can get that sound. Forget it. It's not going to happen. So if this is the pitch that you intend, then just get rid of the harmonic marks, right? But the idea of the harp plucking those pitches themselves, right, is great. And if and even an octave higher is great. But it's just better to have it without the harmonics. Um, I've got a tip about this too. Um, 
Now I can't even remember which book that is in. <laughs> um, it's in the new one. Look under, uh, um, look at a hundred more orchestration tips, and look at the uh, harp registers, which also um, talks about like how low you can pl you can score a harmonic for harp. So if we assume this is scored correctly, the note to be plucked sounding an octave higher, it's it's just a little too low for it to be a coherent sound. You know, some harpists specialize in playing lower harmonics, but it's just better to avoid it and just you know, um, you know, like I would say just below the staff, just don't score don't score any harmonics below the staff and harp. And actually I almost never score anything lower than like a C or a B in the staff in terms of harmonics, like the um, of the note to be plucked sounding an octifier. Okay, um, yeah, so, you know, just looking at everything else, bum, 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 bum. You know, I mean, I, I like it. I, you know, you've got this divisi. It's going to make the strings a little softer, but it's not going to be that big of a deal. Um, you know, and, you just, and it's really, really thick, full scoring. Um, what if you had scored this with the winds the way they are, the brass the way it is, all good, all fine, everything's fine. Okay, um, what if you had scored this just like this, but you had had the strings in just in octaves, doing that F sharp and so on, walking down, um, just in octaves all the way through with more strings per note. So I, I want you just to go try that, just like, um, just score this all octaves, you know, you got your F sharp here, then um, take the next F sharp an octave higher there, and then the then the F sharp on top like this, and then that one there. You know, just just uh, just try that out and see what happens. I think what you'll find is that the sound of the strings just playing a single note in that octave are they're more forceful, right? Because you have more you have more strings playing per note. They're more unified because it's all octaves and they're all relating to each other. And the wi the winds and brass give the illusion, they lend the illusion that the strings are playing harmony along with everything else. Okay, so that's the oldest orchestration trick in the book. Yeah, you know, I think that goes back to Berlioz or Weber or somebody like that. You know, or even Bra uh, Beethoven may have sort of played around with that idea. All right, but it's you know the 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 strings do not need to be playing harmony along with you know with all of this nicely spaced harmony in the in the winds and brass right it's kind of better for them just to be playing octaves and then the ear thinks that it's a fully formed right and then here like the only critique that i would have here is that the you know, you've got you've got your tremolo here which is a softer sound and you've got your brass, just a really warm sound, and the, that will just basically suck up the resonance of, you know, you'll hear the kind of sound, but you won't really hear the string tone because the um, the brass will absorb it. So, you know, and so will the lower string, this used to be the lower winds will also help to absorb these lowly placed, um, uh, uh, this slowly placed string scoring. I mean, it's not wrong, it's just, you know, it's not going to really have that much effect in terms of contributing to the pitch, right? And then, yeah, I mean, you'll be able to hear the upper winds fine. So anyway, so think about all those things, okay? I mean, I hope that that's a, that that is a useful um, evaluation for you. And, and, you know, I mean, some, there's just, it has a beautiful, simple sound. Um, you know, it's nice. I mean, I, I really loved Chicago's, um, you know, very, poetic, uh, you know, um, fluid, uh, bustling approach. And then I also like this really simple, you know, it sort of reminds me a little bit of like the opening of Ravel's orchestration to um, uh, Beauty and the Beast, like, or the, not Beauty and the Beast, sorry, um, the uh, Sleeping Beauty, like in the woods uh, from the Mother Goose Suite. Okay, so great score. Uh, this is really getting me excited. I can't wait to look at the next one. Um, so let's take a look at that now, and thank you so much, Antony, for your entry.
and now we have Juan's score. Now, um, you probably noticed <clears throat> that the playback was sort of doing the opposite of what the dynamics indicated. And there were some places where the it almost sounded as if the, um, the audio had been kind of filtered or, or stopped and started or whatever. Okay, so this is because of the uh, MIDI messages. Now I'm just going to select the entire score, which is going to take a second because the MIDI messages in this score are so massive. There are just so many of them. Okay, so finally it's it is latched on to everything. And yeah, just look at all of those. There's just, you know, probably hundreds and thousands of those MIDI messages uh, in the score. Now I'm going to unclick it, which is also going to take a little bit just because of just this, it's so uh, data dense, that many messages. All right, so um, what you need to do, Juan, when you import your score into Sibelius is there will be a box on the dialogue, um, on the menu for you to import, and you need to uncheck the box that says include MIDI messages, okay? And then that will take care of that. All right, now, <clears throat> I mean, I could have gotten in touch with you and asked you to do this and so on and so forth, but, you know, then that might just lead to more questions and, and so on. And I just really want this to be about the evaluation of the orchestration, which, you know, I can read, I can see everything that needs to be commented on. So there's just really no need to, um, to go to that much of a hassle over it. I mean, it's already, you know, <clears throat> it's already enough that I am including what, um, what, mock-ups are available okay all right so let's look at the score i felt that you know you've, you've got some really delightful ideas here I, I love the um idea of the little trills and the violins underneath the evolving melody in the winds okay so <clears throat> so you know the question is like well, how could we improve this and so on and so forth so let's focus on that so there's nothing really all that, you know, much of an issue in the first eight bars and the strings. The triangle is fine, okay, and bass clarinet plus bassoons, it's all good. I mean, you could have had three bassoons and just kept it completely even if you wanted to, but I, I love the idea of the bassoons as kind of an instrument that can fix things and do other things and so on. Okay, um, now the where we get into a problem is here at the beginning, okay? So you have the... Um, uh, clarinet, it, it's 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 a little um, inconsistently marked, right? So here you say solo, and there you say one. So are, are you just intending the flute, like like a conductor would look at this and say, okay, well the flute's not really a solo; it's just sort of adding a little bit of tone to the solo clarinet. But you do no, it doesn't matter whether that is your intention or you not. You need to tell us which clarinet that is, right? You can't just say solo. All right, you have got to say, oh, see there's that lag um, in the uh, in the instructions. It's just because it's there's just so many of those MIDI messages. All right, so that is how to mark that, okay? One solo. So, um, yeah, just always tell us which instrument because it's sort of like saying, hey, solo. Well, which one plays solo? The, you know, the copyist will say, okay, well, it's probably... He probably means the first, but are you going to leave things leave things up to the copyist, or are you going to actually tell us what you mean? Right? Don't leave it up to the copyist to guess what is probably right, because what if you intended it for the second player to be solo? Right? What if the players, um, you know, get a part that has both? Um, you know, what what if they get both parts and they say, well, you know, it doesn't really say which one of us plays solo and it is in the first part, but do you want to do it? You know, so, I mean, anything could happen. Always tell us who is playing what part. Don't just write solo. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Um, now, the problem here really is that you have got an instrument in its weakest register, this first octave, the flute is in its first octave, and it's playing with an instrument that is fairly, you know, um, it's fairly well-bodied, like, you know, from B up, right? It is it is the beginning of the clarino register, and it's, it's got a beautiful, nice sound there, right? Now, when it dips down to A, that's in the throat tones, but a, a clarinetist will kind of cover that difference, just, 
you know, they've learned to make everything sound even, so they'll they'll make it richer. All right, so so basically the clarinet is is very nice and, and rich and everything else, and the flute is pretty much inconsequential, excuse me, inconsequential, until around E, F sharp, G, right, is where things start to pick up, ska- uh, pick up steam. And so really, like, you might as well just have a solo clarinet till about right here right or maybe right here I see you're doing something similar that to what I did which is to have um, have one part play the the downward um, the the sort of downward uh, falling motive and um, the other part just continue on which I think is great I mean that's a that's a great approach now you go farther in that you you have one part play the entire melody and the other part just hold on to the top which is not what I did I just had the falling um, in another instrument now be aware that um, tenuto gives you a very blocky tone right so it's just uh, like I was explaining in a previous evaluation in this um, in this video that it's just basically like a box right it doesn't have that beautiful like attack and then swelling and then being tailed off it just goes chunk and then continues on and then lift let's go right so it it really is a you know a a more forceful sound though it's not necessarily about force it's about um it's about articulation right it's about the shape of the note okay um so so i i think it's i think that the balance is actually pretty good it's like the the you could just basically throw away what you heard in the mock-up because this is, you know, by the time we get to about right here, which you should really indicate as being like mezzo forte or something, then the horns come in and play this little harmony to kind of make it richer. So that's a great idea, okay? Pianissimo, crescendo to, I don't know, piano, mezzo piano. The, uh, the, the winds and strings should crescendo to mezzo forte so that there's you know you actually really have to choose something for them to do all right you cannot just say oh we're going to get a little louder and then whatever right now you really tell us okay it really helps the conductor it helps the players tell us where your destination is like little fluctuations like this you know inside a bar that's not a big deal but you know, uh, covering a phrase, you should really tell us where we're headed. Okay. Now, I feel that, um, like I've said before, I've, I've commented before, there's really no need for the accompaniment to swell. Okay. Because that's it, the left hand of the pianist cannot swell, right? It's basically just holding this chord and changing a single note in it. And if you change the note on the piano and bring out that note and play it louder then it will sort of it just it's counterintuitive right so if it's counterintuitive to make this single note louder then maybe it's counterintuitive to make uh, make the accompaniment swell underneath the melody the melody is what the the little nuances are intended for not necessarily the accompaniment right so i mean i'm not saying it's wrong to to score the dynamics the way you did but i'm just pointing out Right, that it's not necessarily, you know, the the. I mean, everybody chose, or not everybody, but so many people chose to do this, uh, of having the accompaniment swell. But that's not necessarily what the music needs to do until you get to about right here. Okay, <clears throat> now here you've got a fourth horn playing this one very very low note here. Okay, and that, since this is a transposing score, and that's a low, uh, that is a low C sharp, then it is really kind of like F sharp, this same note right here, right? Um, now, if you want to do this, I think that you need to do more reading of orchestration manuals because one one bit of good advice in practically every orchestration manual is that you should double your low horns, right? Uh, because when they are all by themselves like this, then they have a tendency to, you know, the the wavering. There's there's a little bit of wavering. Uh, uh, you know, it's it's very very hard for any but the the best the best of the best horn players to play a low note solid like that, unquavering all the way through. Uh, so when you double them up, 
Um, I mean, it's it's always good to double up horns below middle C or below F sharp, but like especially here, very very low note. Then, um, then this note should definitely. I mean, this in old notation, this would be C sharp below the bass staff, right? So new notation, and this is totally fine to write this in treble clef. I think that's great. Okay, um, but. You should really think, you know, the more ledger lines you drop down, the more important it is for you to double it. So the second horn player and the fourth horn player should be playing this together, right? And it's not going to make this, it's not going to make the note any louder. It's just going to make it steadier to have both horns on it, right? And just um, a much smoother note. And, and I really love this right in here, the bass clarinet um, playing octaves with the double bass. That's great. Okay. Um, okay. So now we've got just you know da 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 bum bum ba da bum bum. Good for you. You got the melody right. Excellent. Okay. Or at least at least in my universe. Just kidding. Okay. And then yeah. And then you've got your um, you've got your clarinet going up to here. So so you've got doubling. See, this is really great. You've got doubling of the of the D sharp here. Right in the oboe, so that's that's really important, and it really helps to stabilize it. There should be something to double the A here. I think like um, here you could have gone to um, it's just sounding F sharp. Here this could have been F sharp, like you could have gone to um, one of the other strings could have thrown in, like you could have gone to VZ here on the second violins and had that A in there, just like from a from a different. So, so you've got the you got the uh, force of the first, and then you have like a little bit of restraint of the of the uh, seconds, doubling this note here. Okay, so but anyways, that that was nice. All right, <clears throat> now we're going to bum 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 bum. Now, okay, so once again, like here you've got. I'm, I'm just wondering if you really are understanding the implications of marking a tenuto for strings, right? So, think of think of tenuto. For the for strings as being a full long bow, right? So that you know that tends to mean that the bow is going to be a little faster, and it's going to have sort of a zoom sound, a zoom, and, and it just really is just like the winds is like a blocky note, right? So it just it starts fast and hard and lets go, just drops off the cliff instead of coming to a nice shaped ending, right? So you know you're going you're going to go zoom pow right <laughs> so it's it's it, I, I would say the problem here is that we've got um, we have inconsistent markings across both sections some it's, some notes are not accented some are some have tenuto some don't and you know in a case like this <clears throat> you often have the conductor just basically deciding, okay, um, who doesn't have an accent at bar 5, 10, 13? Who does not have a, an accent at bar 13? Put an accent in your part. If you don't have an accent, put a tenuto in your part the beat before if you do not have a tenuto. All right, now let's take this again. See, and then, and then the amount of time it took for the conductor to say that has basically cost you about maybe $75 of rehearsal time right because you know they're paying 70 to 100 people and um, each of those people is making union scale right so which can I'm just trying to think in my head is like could be like five thousand dollars an hour so you just divide all that up into seconds across your you know your rehearsal time and that is what it's costing you to put something inconsistent in your score so really try to just Make everything make sense as much as possible for the players. All right. <clears throat> so, and then this little pluck here. Now, all right, two problems. Now, just as I mentioned that this is this low playing right in here is probably not going to balance with the clarinet, it gets even worse here, right? Because here you've got, um, you've got muted ho horns, right? Which could also be stopped, but it doesn't matter. So muted horns, you're going all the way up to F sharp here. 
Um, it's, you know, I mean, pianissimo for uh, first horn playing F sharp up there, it's, it's subjective. Like, what does that mean, right? Does it actually mean pianissimo for the rest of the orchestra? Usually not. Okay, so that means everybody in the else everybody else in the orchestra should be loud, right? I would mark mezzo forte in the celesta, so you get like the loudest on the celesta, which is mezzo piano, but like just mark it mezzo forte anyways. Mark the pizzicato, uh, I would say mezzo piano or mezzo forte, okay, and then um, you know, and then you'll get a balance right in there. And I don't, I don't think that it, it needs to be uh, pianissimo; it could just be piano, right? Uh, which is much more realistic of what it's going to sound like up there on that top line. But the flute has got to change. This should so much be clarinet, right? Because just the, the this is this is one of the softest registers of an instrument of a wind instrument in the entire orchestra. Okay, there's like no way to balance the tonality, right? See, it's more than just about like projection. It's also about the timbral quality right and the timbral quality of muted horns right in here is just going to bury anything that the flute is trying to do right here okay and then you've got this little piccolo yeah you've only got like two notes in piccolo why not just change this to clarinet change that to first flute and get rid of the piccolo right saved you just saved you know saved like 50 bucks for the orchestra okay um, everything else, that's all cool. All right, now, bum, 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 bum. So we've got trumpets. We're playing all the way up to F sharp right there. There was a, there's a fault in one of these chords. You go figure it out, okay? So something in the harmony here isn't right. <clears throat> okay, so it's clarinets uh, plus horns, right? You know, that's going to be the high part of the harmony. And then under that, you've got English horn. And... Um, and bass clarinet being played fairly high, which I think is very cool, and then bassoons, right? So that is being matched perfectly, like note for note, mostly, by our heavy brass. And, okay, so like heavy brass plus winds, what you have to decide is, do you really want a, <clears throat> do you want a merged sound here? Or do you want a, or do you want just brass with a little bit of wind coloring? Because that's the way you've scored it, right? If you want this to blend, you have to mark the winds forte. They have to be up one dynamic level, right? It's not enough to go mezzo forte crescendo and then, oh, now they're louder by the time they get to here. No way. This has got to be noticeably louder from the beginning, okay? So in that way, it will all balance going out. Um, and the tremolo here is just not going to be heard. Like these strings are just, there's no way that they can really, you know. This is kind of cool. Um, these notes up here uh, that change to, you know, change to harmonics and everything else. That is very, very cool. I like that a lot. And the sultasto, the artificial harmonics on top. That's all really cool, and then you yeah, and you've got the um, you got the little pling from the celesta and the uh, rising octaves in your harp, and the resolution in the horns, and you've got plenty of time to take the mutes out right in here, you know, bum 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 bum, right. But what I would say is uh, right here at the beginning, hang mutes, all right. Just say it right here. And they'll have the they'll have their mute hanging from their wrist, and they can play this. They'll play that low note, pop the mute in right in here, right, and then they'll take it out. They'll take the mutes out, and then they'll play this. So right hang mutes right here. Okay, so cool score, Juan. I mean, really, really enjoyable to look at. And I mean, just you know, I mean, if you just fix some of those things, then yeah. I mean, try to get it. Try to see if. You know, somebody will read a little bit or piece of your score, or if you go on to like score the rest of it or something else. Okay, but but it, you know, I mean, it's got some really neat things in it. Just you just have to, um, you know, do not overestimate the strength of the flute because it's not all that strong in its first octave. Okay, um, and also think about not just the projection and the volume and the dynamics as being raw 
you know, qualities un into themselves that if you just balance those with a dynamic mark here or there, then you're fine. Because that's not true. Because, because winds and brass have a certain kind of overtone that can block out other things, even when you have, you know, you might have everything else balanced according to some mathematical formula. And, and you'll still not be able to hear certain elements, certain overtones, certain richer qualities from the strings because, you know, just because of the peculiarities of the, say, the body of tone that sits above the fundamental. All right, go read my, um, go check out my uh, diagrams on, um, on the harmonic spectra of muted brass, okay? And uh, in 100 more orchestration tips, just to hear what I, or to, to read, to see what I mean by body of tone, right? So anyhow, um, really great, really enjoyable. Now let's check out the next score. Now for Nicolas's score. Yeah, so um, I, I, I really like this a lot. Uh, Nicolas, I don't know what, um, what application you're using, but I really strongly recommend um, checking out Note Performer, which I, I've heard is now available for um, the sort of the big three of notation applications. Uh, Finale, Sibelius, of course, and Dorico. So just, you know, I, I think that they would give you a much more sophisticated sounding mock-up. And as people know, I think I've said this a few times throughout this series of evaluations, um, in the past, I kind of wanted to get away from mock-ups and get people to just really think about the sound of the score. And while, of course, that is still the most important thing, of just really knowing what it sounds like without having to have a mock-up. I do feel that having a decent mock-up is a professional reality and you know you should be, be trying to make your scores sound as good as possible for potential clients um, uh, to use in multimedia situations for performances, rehearsals for different artists um, and you know and then just like of course just just sealing the commission you know, I mean, I've sat down with a conductor and have played him this one overture that I thought was going to be part of the production. And based on that, that was that sort of sealed the deal. Of course, they were going to go ahead with this particular um, with this particular concert. Uh, but I was able to talk the um, talk the conductor into having an overture that opened things up because I was, you know, I played some of the themes and everything else just on the piano and, you know, he had a good enough ear to know that that was going to sound great uh, and he trusted me as an orchestrator. Uh, however, um, you know, you cannot count on the general manager of the orchestra or, you know, whoever is making the decisions. Okay. So that's my little spiel about, about that, but just, you know, try to try to find something that will just a little bit more realistically, you know, it doesn't have to be no performer, it could be some other, you know, um, sound set or combination, but just look into that, all right? Okay, um, <clears throat> now let's take a look at the score as you scored it. Um, now I just got through talking about how weak the, um, the flutes are, uh, compared to the strings or compared to pretty much everybody else in their first octave. And this is really no different. Um, I feel you'd be better off with um, like, just just use your clarinets and bass clarinets um, playing this figure. Just put the, just turn this into a bass clarinet line and turn this into your into a clarinet line. And then you have a perfectly balanced, beautiful backgroundy kind of a thing, all right? Now, er everywhere else that you scored the uh, the flute in this first phrase is great, right? 
so but we'll talk about some of the other things that you know are a little maybe a little questionable as we go along but yeah but the the um you know aside from that i mean i mean it'll work it's like not that it won't work to have the flute there but i mean there are just so many scores that are scoring low flute just right at the beginning right in in textures like this just taking it for granted so ple people please avoid using low flute unless you really are you know unless it is a quality it, unless it's part of a texture or part of a motive or something like that that is really beautifully showcased or or is very carefully balanced right so i don't feel that this is carefully enough balanced to justify the use of the flutes there okay so you know maybe if they were marked piano or something i, I don't know but it's still i still feel it's just not quite right i think i think just using all the clarinets there's that gets your three voices right and the the bass clarinet can definitely play this very very softly on the bottom right okay all right so you've got muted um you've got muted strings and you give your players plenty of time for you know the smaller mutes the little rubber mutes that kind of attach to the bridge or just like or little rubber bands or whatever to be moved off within a couple of bars that's fine uh and then there was this other thing too oh yeah so you've got um I think if you're going to say open, then, you know, you could just say stopped here instead of boucher. All right. So just, yeah, you know, stick to one language, you know, except, except for like things like consort, sends a sword, whatever, you know. Um, and I mean, if you, you know, if you really, if you're really a fan of, um, of Italian, you could say, um, um, Cuso and Aperto, right? All right. Now here, like you don't need this dashed line if you just put in just put in a um, a first voice rest above, right? And then you don't even need the number two, right? So just have a first voice rest above, and then this below and then you don't need the dashed line everybody knows that this is just going to be what it is right of course there's no reason why this couldn't just be the first you know why can't this be the first player twice just playing the same note that they're sitting on and then the second player comes in and plays that other one right that would work perfectly fine yeah you know, you know i mean it, it you don't always have to give the um second player something to do um you know, just because they're there, right? Like right here, for instance, this would also work best with the first player, I think I feel. You know, they're you know, they're doing their thing and then they come in here and they play this and then the second player comes in under them. I think that that works out better. And same thing right here, right? Um now of course this is this is fine, right? The lower player playing under and then coming in, you know, with a first player coming in over them, that's fine. Okay. Two bassoons um, which bassoons, right? Which bassoon is playing this first, second? Right. So not all of these are marked. Okay, so things climb up. Here you have the piccolo takeover. Now just really be aware that the piccolo is very soft in this first octave, right? So it's, you know, it's really not going to be taking over with much convincing weight, especially considering the fact that your first violins are going all the way up to mezzo forte here. You have your uh, you have your winds pretty much in the background most of the time and I feel that they could be about the same dynamic as the strings for most of this but it's great that you have the uh, horns in the background right and you got a little cymbal roll here um, so it probably would help to know whether or not this is intended to be soft mallets or sticks all right that's because um, that really will have a different quality of sound I would suggest soft mallets so you get a whoosh rather than a, than a, you know, than that sort of zoom kind of like um, a kind of more aggressive sound of the sticks. Okay, and then here I would say it's better just to have a line that says gliss in it, right? I think that that's, that just works better. Okay, now, um,
so these these are pretty close together. So you you know you're having one hand pluck the D sharp sounding an octave higher, right? And then you have the other hand playing F sharp up a third from there. They're just really close together. I mean it's doable, but it's just you know like the the palm of the uh, or the the heel of the palm is going to be sitting against the string, right? While the right hand reaches over, and it's just a it's just a little funky. Um, yeah, I mean it's kind of like you want both of them. What if you were to pluck here and then start the um, start the um, the glissando right afterwards? Like just start like a split second later. Like maybe you know start on the um, on like one and right or one e. <laughs> rather than just right on one. I just feel you get a just a clearer sound and 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 less for the player to worry about. All right. All right, so now um the development da 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 dum so we've got English horn, right? And once again, like flute is just not going to be contributing a whole lot here. And especially like since you've got the the English horn marked louder anyways, right? Then what what chance does the poor flute have against that and horns going on and this tremolo? It's you know still not the strongest place for the flute. Da 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 da. And then you have sort of answering, which I kind of like. That you you use you make different choices, um, which is I mean it it's great in one way, but in another way, you know it's the same quality of sound to a degree because it's like the like English horn and then oboes, which are very similar, right? They're not the same, but they're very similar. Okay, so da 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 da. Yeah, and and here, um, the this little A sharp right in here is very is going to be a very neglected note, right? Um, you know what's wrong with having one of the flutes take over this line and having the having one of the clarinets handle this A sharp sounding C sh or written C sharp. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the the flute is is going to add to the quality of this F sharp here by the time you get to there, uh, but the first couple of notes are really not going to add a whole lot. And then you've got this ba -ba -bum, way up high in the in your piccolo, but like, <clears throat> um, what does this mean? Da, you know. It, uh, it, it's it's you're slurring across two notes which aren't tied, right? So maybe rethink that. I mean, it it happens. Like slurs will happen across the a repeated note which isn't tied, and the player will put in a little bit of, you know, they'll articulate it again, sort of a little bit more gently. But that isn't really a standard thing. Just I would say avoid it if you are thinking about it and you notice it. It's a not it's not really a fatal error or anything. But just try not to do that. Okay. All right, now here this this ends up putting a lot of weight on that you know da da da. da. So what's going to happen is it's just going to be da bum, you know, a little bit more force, even though it's just a trumpet, right? Okay, and then bump 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 bum. So we've got our you've got muted trumpets and uh, stopped horns. Now I, I'm not so sure why this is the third and fourth. I mean, it's perfectly fine for them to play it, but this isn't a very long excerpt or a very long piece. It's probably, you know, in a situation where if you do get this read, it, you know, it might, you might be working with a semi-pro orchestra or even a student or university orchestra, in which case it'd be better to give this to the first and second, you know, the two people who've got a relationship in that section more than anybody else, right? This is kind of strange how these got offset, and I'm wondering why. Okay, um, maybe this had originally been, uh, you know, if this is Dorico or Finale and you have to indicate that the note is offset and then you brought it down and you changed your mind about it but you didn't reset the spacing. I don't know. I don't know how those other applications work. Okay, but it's still a really cool idea. And, yeah, I mean, you know, once again, we got all this low stuff. The low piccolo is no less weak, right? So bump 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 bump. This very fat, um, you know, rich 
sound right in here of uh, horns plus trumpets is pretty much going to blot out whatever is going on here in the um, in those these low flutes. And then we have this beautiful gentle answering. Okay, so you know here, like once again, really low flute. So like I would say, just don't, you know, don't really count on them to really add a whole lot, right? And the same thing here with this, this second flute part right in here. So you know, couldn't the second flute have played the first clarinet's part, and then the first clarinet could play the second flute's part, and you'd have a much more balanced. Um, you'd have much more balanced stuff going on in here. So I just say in general that um, that I love the way that you break you've broken up these long phrase, these long slurs into smaller, more bowable kinds of things. You know, down, up, down, or it could be even up, down, up. Just like if you want to, if the players want to make use of that, but don't mark it; they'll figure that out. Okay, pretty much like zero chance that this harp will be heard against that richness of tone. But I do like the fact that you have balanced it. I think that the winds could be mezzo forte, but just keep the keep the horns softer. And here, you know, you could definitely mark up your your um, your harp all the way through this. All right, it could be mezzo piano throughout, and then this could be mezzo forte, and then just you know, here I would just keep it keep it loud. You know, because the the harp, you know, especially right here, you've got this brass right in here. Mezzo forte on the harp is not even going to be heard, right? So, yeah, these elements of harmony are not going to count for anything, right? Um, I mean, the harp would be better off doing something like this than, you know, than low flutes, I would say. You know, you could have that sparkling over the top and everybody would be able to hear it, as opposed to down here where it would just get buried. Okay, um, but yeah, and then the resolution's cool. Uh, so yeah, so I mean, really cool score. Um, really loved looking at this, Nicholas, and and I would really love to see um, what you would possibly do with our next um, our next year's orchestration challenge because I would love to see your score in that. Okay, and more I will not say. <laughs> Okay, so thanks so much, uh, and now let's take a look at the next score in this roster. Our next score is from Emmett, and Emmett, I got an email from you <clears throat> about a week or two ago uh, asking whether or not I had forgotten about your score and everything else. Um, you might not have seen the roster where I had everything up, and I was, I think I listed in what order the pieces were going to be evaluated and everything else. Maybe I didn't, but anyhow, um, I had not forgotten you, and here is your evaluation now. Okay. So, starting with <clears throat> the beginning here, <clears throat> some more Sibelius knowledge here. Now, uh, I was just talking about um, the importance of uniformity in um, assigning dynamics to parts, right? So, right here we've got dynamics. Here, I'll just just going to select these two bars and then I'm going to type shift option D that could also be shift alt D if you're on a PC okay and then you can see the um, you can see that it's all green scale right now I'm gonna bring up the um, the keypad okay and I'm going to click on the number all or the not number two but all right and at this point that means that this will apply to all voices, right? Because the way that you had it before, you could hear in that mock-up, <clears throat> if people want to jump back and listen to it again, 
you can hear in the mock-up that the actual melody here da 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 is like completely inaudible right and it's just because <clears throat> however I don't, I don't know what what level uh, the first voice thought it was playing but the second voice was getting was the one that was getting the crescendo right so anyhow um, so aside from that little problem which is just a mock-up thing it has nothing to do with the um, with the actual orchestration of the piece aside from that little problem this is actually nicely done so clarinets um, uh, third flute playing the top of the harmony and having the first and second flutes ah two you could just say ah two here or you could say one and two ah two or something or just say one and two you don't have to say ah two um, that that will actually work great right because you're because the soft flute is playing against another soft flute flute and clarinets now you know what you could do to make this even better like or to make it even clearer is you could put the um, crescendo above the staff and first voice <clears throat> and just apply it to the melody only and not to the accompaniment right and so this is interesting so I would just say P non arp and then when you get to mezzo piano say mezzo piano arp right um, yeah because like you know it's, it just keeps it simpler I think the brackets are just really unnecessary and sometimes they will um, you know they'll they'll look too much like a bar line or they'll, they'll get overlooked or whatever and you get the wrong effect so I think it's you know there's no way to avoid it if it's if it is part of the dynamic text and it just is right there in the middle and it says non arp all right that's just the fastest most comprehensible easiest way to go about it all right now you come in here simplice so in other words not too nuanced um, now do you really want the bulge to be right here and not right here right I believe in the in the piece um, yeah I'd have to I'd have to review it but yeah yeah, it's, it's probably fine. Okay, so we've got our uh, which oboe? Both oboes? One oboe? I right, didn't mark it. All right, let's just assume that that is first oboe. So we've got the oboe uh, crawling up here, and that's probably going to be the dominant voice right in here, right? Um, and then as the as thing as the line gets higher. You are going to um, you're going to hear more and more flute and less and less oboe. Okay, and then yeah, piccolo, it's fine. See, I, I like the way that you don't throw the F sharp up here, the up the octave. Now you could get a soft high F sharp here. You could actually be doubling this. You could you could actually assign octaves here and get a better balance, right? So you have um, you have first flute doubling the piccolo, and then you have second flute doubling the first oboe, right? And then that might work better with this resolution right in here. Okay, and then right in here, yeah, soft horns, that's all good. See, so like there's there's a lot of good scoring in this, um, you know, and, and, and there are going to be some things that I kind of like pick out and so on. I don't know why you need to go parentheses forte, right? It's like it's either forte or it isn't forte, right? I mean, if you want a sort of a gentler forte then you could write poco forte right or you could just write mezzo forte it's almost the same thing so um <clears throat> there are a bunch of different ways of interpreting poco forte and i used to use it more than i do now like my my big opus has um caused slight consternation amongst um certain members of certain orchestras um you know running into poco forte and poco piano it just it just means it's a little more little less um, you know and it, it's it's but then in Brahms it means something a little different you know it's like Poco of the forte of the you know of the previous um, dynamic right so people people get picky about that stuff but if you just like if you look at my scores you can tell what it means um, in context okay so yeah, I mean, this is, 
you don't even need to. I mean, yeah, Divisi is better with um, with perfect fifths, so that's all good. Yeah, and you know, Glock and Spiel working together with the harp here, a little bit of triangle and cymbal. Yeah, it's all nice. So, so I approve of the way that uh, that that all comes together. All right, then bass clarinet. Um, that is very cool in octaves with uh, double bass. We we saw this before in another score in this set of evaluations. Now this is really great. This stands out beautifully because there is space in the music for it to do so, right? So this this lovely little bit of harp scoring right in here comes through really great. Look, just don't put mezzo forte below. I don't do that stuff. Just put a forte right here and just make them play at forte, right? Then it's going to sound great. And I would just, you know, it's not really a solo, but um, you know, I, I would say you could write bring out above it, which um, um, I've been looking at a lot of Mahler recently and, you know, hervertretend, you know, so protruding, all right, um, is, would, would work really, really great here. Um, yeah, and then you've got, ba -da -da -da. that's all nice. So you really are keeping it in the strings and bass clarinet keeping it simple it's really great it's very effective and it lets the strings do their thing right uh, now it's really not necessary to say tutti non divisi right non divisi where what does that what does that even mean right because you don't have any double stops or intervals or anything right maybe this jumped up from somewhere else jumped over from somewhere else okay so anyway um, you would not want to write this here because they might say, oh, we're not supposed to have any divisi anywhere, so how does this work? Right, where you have two lines kind of starting at different places. Um, I would definitely shorten this right here. Um, hang on, it's hard to get a hold of the end of a slur sometimes. There we go. Right, and then if you really wanted this divisi or non divisi, that this is definitely possible, right? But I mean, it's really, I think you really want this to be a little, sh not schmaltzy, but you know, espressivo, da 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 da. You know, and why does, why does this not get a, a diminuendo and everybody else does, right? What's going on there? Okay, um, and then bump, 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 bump. Okay, so I've there were a couple of other scores that, or there's one, at least one other score that did the piano style um, uh, slur over staccato and then going on to another note, sometimes an accent. Okay, so don't do this. All right, because I'm mean, in the first place, you want an articulated downbeat, don't you? All right, dun 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 dun. You don't really want. Da, da, da. Right? This is what you're going to get. So look, there's nothing wrong with that, right? Okay. Then, all right, now, you know, I mean, what are the flutes doing here? You have mezzo forte oboe, oboes. You have mezzo forte horns, which, by the way, are going to just, they're just going to swamp the oboes. But, I mean, what is the, what are the flutes even doing there? Who's going to hear this? That is like this, you know, it's the softest register in the wind section, right? Of, of any wind instrument in the wind section, All right? So this is really not contributing anything and it's marked way, way down. So what is it doing there, All right? So I'm just, this is not for you to answer to me. This is for you to answer to yourself. Uh, strings would be better here, marked up at a louder dynamic, right? Okay. I mean, you've got, you basically have the same pitches right you've got your f sharp right here and the d sharp to go into the c sharp right there right and um and then right and some of this is doubling right you've got the a sharp right in here doubling the fourth horn okay so i mean i just think that this is a better string idea and also not marked down to so soft okay um now why are the oboes playing mezzo staccato and the horns not playing any kind of articulation except for an accent right here? And the accent seems to be 
yeah, I mean, seems to be in that um, that second voice right here for second horn. <clears throat> All right, so it just needs a little bit of work, right? So here you're doubling, like, you know, you've got a doubled accent here, and you've got your third, um, you got your third flute, looks like. And the, you know, plus your violas. Nobody's going to hear the third flute here, let alone the other two flutes. Okay. Um, yeah, and then you've got, I see, I see. So this is first voice going down to, yeah, that's a little strange. So just, I think this needs a lot of work. Here you need to indicate that you're going from piccolo back to third. Okay. Um, then we've got our answer, same same comments here, you know, mezzo staccato should just cover, you know, the, the slur should just cover the staccato. And then you can articulate this downbeat here. Okay, and yeah, the harp there, you know, yeah, better not to even have the harp playing here. And then here, you know, still strong, right? And bum 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 bum. Okay, this is strange. You've got a you got a staccato mark on a you've got staccato marks on um on your dotted half note and then in their their slurred. So that doesn't quite make sense, right? He's like mezzo staccato on a really long note value. Uh, just you know, like if you just intend for this to be lasting for one and a half beats then just write one and a half beats right and don't do this this just confuses right raised hands in rehearsal right that is your enemy don't score anything that will cause a raised hand in an in rehearsal if if at all possible um i had a really long record of no raised hands in rehearsal but then i you know i should have known better i was uh, working with uh, a guy who's become a friend of mine uh, recently on one of his scores and I actually orchestrated it and then Orchestra Wellington performed it and you know there, I mean there was just something in the music that that caused me to score this sort of slightly contradictory thing for the strings and I you know I saw it I was looking at it and I should have known better than to do that because sure enough we wasted an entire minute or two working out with what I actually meant there and I, you know, in the end, they just did it the way that I should have scored it. So, all right. Um, so now, do you really want slurred accents? So slurred accents have to be played diaphragmatically, right? So if you get rid of the slur, then it's tongue, 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 right? Um, but if you so if you have them all in a row, it's tongue, right? So you have a you have a nice precise accent on the first one, and then you have your the gut sort of punching these right, which is not the same sound at all. Okay, and then you, once again we've got some instruments without the accents and some with. And what's going on here? All right. Okay. So and then here we've got uh, portato in the strings. You know. Mm, mm, mm. All right. So I mean, and then rest. Mm. So yeah, I mean the balance is there. Okay, but like we've got, we've got like no string sound at the top, right? So what what you're gonna end up with this kind of scoring. You know, you've got your trumpet is playing that high F sharp, and then you've got the flutes filling in the chord above with the piccolo on top. Okay, so the top of the chord is going to be nice and bright with with kind of winds and then lower than that you're going to have um, clarinets mixed with uh, trumpets mixed with strings right and you know what if you know just try an experiment um, just make a make a second copy of this and then delete delete this harmonic approach and just score octaves have your first play the same thing as the piccolo and then your seconds play that same exact line down an octave and then your violas playing down from that right and then just score the same exact thing for the cello too right Let's see how that sounds right so like i said in a previous evaluation in this group <coughs> you will end up with 
the winds and brass supplying the harmony and the sound of the octaves in the strings implying that the strings are also playing the harmony but the ear is able to focus on the on the presence and identity of the strings because they are present throughout okay so i and and you know i mean if there was any way to uh, you know, i don't know if portato works with slurred accents I mean, I just say pick one or the other, right? Or maybe just have them, you know, maybe just change everything, have everything portato or everything slurred accents, or maybe just get rid of the slurs. I mean, here you're not using them or, you know, or in the, the lower heavy brass. Okay. Anyways, and then nice little resolution at the end. Okay. So, so yeah, I mean, so I, in principle, <laughs> I approve of this score. Okay. Nice work, Emmett. Uh, but you know, just, there's a lot of little things to tweak, and you know, you you did some experiments, and you know, and and um, so so now you know what's gonna, you know, what's the result of that experiment. And um, yeah, so I mean, as I mentioned before, uh, it would be interesting to to uh, see your take on next year's orchestration challenge. So please keep that in mind, and thank you so much for your subscribing to the website. And there will actually be a newsletter coming out um, probably around my birthday, which is, as I mentioned before, is going to be, I guess, Thursday Pacific time. Okay, so let's take a look at the very last evaluation for this group of six scores. And now for the very last score, <laughs> Jonathan's. Now, um, just sort of starting off from the beginning, I'll reiterate what I said before with a couple of other scores in this round. And that is just, you know, look into Note Performer, um, you know, just the, the, you know, not to belabor the point, but I feel that the um, quality of mock-ups, just, you know, having a slightly more realistic um, quality to them. I think that is important. Um, it's certainly nothing to do with the actual quality of the orchestration, but it can actually, you know, I mean, to a degree, if things are not working out right with a with a good uh, with a good sound set, sometimes there is a reason. You know, you get used to it, and you can, you know, you can you can kind of use it as reference although not as a as a you know any kind of final word or anything so <clears throat> let's take a look at this you want um, da, 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 um, um, as a solo violin part which is great now you've marked it mezzo forte and you've marked everybody else piano right just trying to try to get a kind of a balance um, you know I, I think you could you know, in a in a real situation, you could go piano espressivo, and give this part the hairpins, and then have your horns marked uh, pianissimo, and your uh, bassoon marked piano, and the and the strings marked piano. Now, um, I I feel that it is a little strange that the bassoon has no doubling in the strings, right? So you're going to have a couple of cushioned horn, um, you know, you're going to have these cushioned horn uh, and lower string or middle string um, elements to the harmony, and then you're just going to have that one bassoon kind of singing out, and then the viola over that, or excuse me, the solo violin over that. So, I mean, it's not it's not really the best blend, if you know what I mean. And I'm also a little confused at why the bassoon, the first bassoon doesn't get a tie. All right. Now look, if you're going to write one, then you don't need the second voice rest, 
right? And same thing here. If you're going to write the number one, you don't need the second voice rest here, right? Or the number three here, because like that is, it's, it's like an either or thing, right? Either just, you know, leave out the number and write in the second voice rests or, or put in the number and just have it be one, you know, um, <clears throat> you know, one single voice. Now here, like, there are a lot of things where you're using um, uh, two voices in a staff, and you could just use, you could just score out intervals in first voice, right? And that would actually be easier to read. Um, and then you don't have to be worrying about this so much. Now see, like here, this is fine. Um, although I think that the one is, is sort of covered by the, the text of the of the number one is covered by the um, by the bar line. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I just feel that if you know all three of these voices were doubled by strings, and you certainly have the you know you certainly have the strings to go around, you could you could have um, divisi violas or divisi cellos there, right? Um, then that would be a lot more homogeneous and a lot smoother. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, um, you know, just bringing down the volume of the horns and allowing this to be piano espressivo, right? And then, you know, adding voices. Now, da 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 dum, dun 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 dun. Right? You left out the development of the the little the little extra notes that are right in here. You know, da 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 dum. All right. Now. Um, Another thing that's interesting is that while you have very few ties or slurs or anything going on here in your winds and strings, you know, the people who really do need a breath, <clears throat> you've got um, these long, long slurs marked. Now, you cannot do that when you are scoring for strings. You can't just dump the... Um, can't just dump the, the piano-style long slur onto a string part, right? So you have to uh, think about, <clears throat> you know, what would be, you know, uh, what, how, how long can a bow last, right? Um, and usually, like, it's good to have, like, two bows per bar, one bow per bar, that kind of thing, or just to think, you know, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, and so on. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you should um, that doesn't mean that you should score in the actual up and down bow marks. It just means that you should think about like what you know, what are going to be the um, a good like just just to just to put slurs in there, right? That separate out the different elements of um, or the different uh, sections of bowing, right? So you could put in a slur here and then a slur there and then no slur here, right? So immediately we're going. Um, we could probably they would probably go up bow here and then down up down up down up down and so on and then that would uh, you know you would apply that throughout the whole um um all throughout all of your strings now this is kind of interesting you have got first violins divisi one and two and you know i'm, I'm kind of looking at this whole part and thinking about like you know, what is you know where is the difference like I mean except for like four notes here and this solo right in here there's kind of nothing that really justifies the you know splitting up the first violins into two separate things you could like right here you could say like I think la meta right like with half right so half of the desks and then going on to right? or you could even just put in like a, a second voice rest right and say divisi Right, and then half the half of the um, half of the players will sit out, and then they'll and then here you go unison or tutti, tutti I would say sorry. So there really isn't any justification for having two different um, two different uh, divisi bars right in here. Okay, um, and then it's pretty much like just really a lot of unison. Uh, just for this big soaring melody, you know, you might get a lot out of like octaves right in there, or um, you know, there might be, um, you know, it might help the melody to soar a little bit more. 
because it's like hard to really hear. Did you notice it's really hard to hear the Celesta and Glockenspiel right in there uh, in your mock-up? And that's probably true. Just the way the weight that you've got sitting on those on these, you know, this just single um, string line. It doesn't really get divided into octaves until right here in this note. Okay, but I mean, aside from that, it's it's pretty well done. But you need to balance your um, your brass against your strings and winds, right? So it's just really, especially horns have a very penetrating sound. And, you know, no less do trombones, but in a different way. So if you're going to crescendo, like have everybody crescendo to the same point, right? So don't, don't, don't have the strings crescendo first, have everybody crescendo at the same time. And have your strings go like starting piano and then piano crescendo to mezzo forte here, right? Across winds and strings and then mezzo piano in the brass then here pianissimo at the beginning of the horns and then um and then from you know pianissimo crescendo to mezzo piano right and then diminuendo you're giving a destination right in here that's fine Di you know destination diminuendo to pianissimo and then piano for the other instruments now <clears throat> The next thing to say is this, okay? Here you have one and three, right? You're just assuming that one and three make good partners in situations like this, right? Because they're both kind of lead players, right? You, you know, the first is the is the highest player, and then the um, the third is the next highest player. Except you need to go check out my um, horn section uh, roles and relationships tip, which is. Um, it's it's in 100 more orchestration tips, but it's also just on the um, um, it's just on the orchestration online website for anybody to read. Okay, just um, just go there and go to categories and then check on horn and then it'll come up. Okay, uh, but yeah, so like when it, whenever you have something like this where it's just two horns and you know you you really need to think about the the um, you know, making a nice, coherent, beautiful, perfect, intimate harmony, right? Especially in this situation where you're playing perfect fourths. I mean, yeah, what could be more dangerous than that? Um, you really want the first and the second to be playing that, right? Not the third and the fourth necessarily, uh, though that could apply in some cases. But in this case, I would say the first and the second because they really listen to each other all the time, right? That is, it is the second's job to listen to the first and to, you know, and to work that out against the rest of the orchestra and everybody else is playing, right? So, um, so if it's the first and the second, then you have your, your high and low player. And then here you, you know, then you have that same relationship, right? High and low. And then you're just adding voices to that, right? So that it's a fuller sound. Okay, um, now let's go to the development. Da, 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 bum. So here we got flute and oboe playing in octaves. Now, did you notice in your mock-up there's a little bit of that phenomenon where the, you know, the rich lower voice kind of swallows the uh, the bright upper voice of the flute. Now, that happens with strings. It can also happen sometimes with flute and oboe, but like it probably not so much in this situation. Still, just watch out. Now, da 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 da. This is kind of nice. Um, uh, I I won't go into my spiel. Uh, and, yeah, and you bring in a little bit of um, uh, horn and trump and trumpet, right? You you know you want that high F sharp right in there. Once again, you could just like write the number one, and then you know you don't need the the second um, the second voice rest if you don't want to. Okay, I mean, it's it's a lot of emphasis on F sharp, and there's, you know, it would be nice if there was some string doubling or some other kind of, you know, just a little bit more weight on the actual melody in the middle. You know, da 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 da. Um, and then here we're going to, um, looks like portato. All right, so if this is portato, then the, the slur should last until here, right? Group your portatos, right? So it's mm, 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 right? Um, 
and it's just really confused. You have slurring, uh, you have a slur that ends before the bar, you have a slur that goes into the bar, you have an accent. You know, look, you just, you need to unify what is going on so that the orchestra can phrase together, right? You know, you, you don't want like people to raise their hand and say, look, who slurs into the bar there? And they, if they don't, and then like, then you'll have your third player saying, well, you know, I mean, everybody else is slurring, I'm gonna slur, right? So, so look, the best thing to do is just to, just to have slurring within one bar, do not slur into the next bar, that's a piano thing, all right? That's like, that's piano slurring, right? That's piano phrasing, right? Because like when you slur across it, then you want this accent here, but the, they're gonna have to do it with their diaphragm, as a uh, right? Rather than a t, right? Doing with, with their tongue. So you want this to be tongued on the beat, right? And you want a bow, you want a fresh bow on the beat here, especially to match this da, right? It's bow on that. And then, you know, then here you're actually, it's nice. You're balancing, right? Mezzo forte to mezzo piano, mezzo piano to, to piano. I would say mezzo forte to piano, mezzo piano to pianissimo, okay? Just more effective. All right, and then you have this little echo, um, which is kind of cool. All right, just clarinet and B flat. So your third is going to bass clarinet. Okay, okay. And then you're scoring, um, yeah, so this is a C score. So yeah, I, and you're doing it in bass clef. I kind of prefer my scores transposed. Do you know what I mean? It's just easier to read. I know what everybody wants and, you know. We could talk about that some other time, but anyhow. And then same thing here, slurring should be uniform and it should be the same as what happened before, right? So I would just say, don't slur across the bar. That way this downbeat can be tongued, okay? All right, now we finally have our bum, 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 bum. It's kind of interesting here, you've got this sol G, um, on your second violin, and then violas playing fifths. Yeah, I mean, it'll all work fine. Did you ever think of intersecting in sixths, right? Because sixths are just incredibly easy to play. Um, uh, thirds are, are not too hard either, but the sixths are just so simple. They just sit right under your fingers as a string player. So you could have <clears throat> F sharp on top and then A below like this this a right in here and then you could have d under that uh and then uh f sharp below that which i believe is, is a d natural yeah, am i correct in i'm trying to remember anyhow um yeah so so if you have interlocking sixths um you know, you have sixths in your first violin part and then sixth in your second part, violin part, they can cover an octave chord, right? And then your violas, which are kind of the gentlest, weakest instrument, can just end up playing a single note, right? A single, um, you know, they can end up playing like just that, lo that uh, line right in there, uh, the lower, the lower voice. Anyhow, um, yeah, so, so just you know rethink some of those things i love the resolution here at the end this should be pianissimo to blend with the strings unless you want the horns to come out so yeah i mean i really enjoyed this this is this was a cool effort jonathan so so you know think about those general procedures like you know you know if you have the number one you don't need to have a um a bar rest in the second voice that kind of thing um if you have <clears throat> the same rhythm for a long, long expanse of time, four bars or more, you know, just do this, right? Like have the same, um, <clears throat> have the have the same stem for two voices. That's perfectly fine. Um, I think about like, you know, I mean, I think you wanted solo and then you wanted half, like half the strings and then you wanted all the strings and then you ended up with two, um, you know, two staves all the way through. So just think about like la meta, you know, or, or with half, you know, you could just say solo and then you say with half and then you say two T here, right? Don't say two T there, right? So say la meta or whatever, right? And then, 
than all of them and then you don't need to do those kinds of things all right and then you're having your second violins so i mean that plus the little advice i gave you and in, in scoring and so on and um and you know I, th I think it could be fine maybe you could find ways to like economize a little bit maybe you don't need this f sharp here if you've got the same note um from oboe you could just have like two ah uh, two oboes which give you kind of like a, a trumpet like sound right or or just get rid of the second and third oboes entirely since you're not using them so just have a single oboe and then have this same note played by like you know doubled by your first clarinet right so just economize right then you can get rid of your trumpet here now you're only using the tuba for this one low f sharp so why not have a two bassoons right and then you don't need um you know, or even just a single bassoon. It's such it's so soft in there, right? You just have like one bassoon and then you can get rid of your second and third and, and then, you know, maybe that will help you to get this score read if there's a reading session by your local orchestra. And then you can score some more of this piece, right? So anyways, think about all that. One last little thing to remark is Sol D, that should be capital D, right? That should be a capital letter. And same thing here, Sol G should be a capital G. All right, so um, cool score. Really great way to end this uh, group of, uh, of evaluations. And yeah, I'm sort of, so I'm feeling, I'm feeling like I have fresh things to say and I'm not going to be um, just uh, running in a rut, <laughs> uh, but that I'll be able to offer you guys some, some valuable, uh, unique advice hopefully, uh, throughout the upcoming week. And hopefully we'll all wind up on my birthday on Thursday. All right. So thanks again. Thank you to all of you who subscribe to the website. There are some people in these, um, in these website evaluations who had once supported on Patreon. And I want to thank you guys for that support as well. If you, you know, had, had support on Patreon for a while, but you know, couldn't keep it up or just only intended to support for a, a small amount of time, I totally understand that, okay? Uh, I'm amazed that anybody can help me out at all on Patreon um, because, you know, we are musicians and, you know, I mean, it's, and a lot of us are gigging and, and it's kind of hard to justify the expense. So I'm honored, right? And I'm so grateful for people um, just subscribing to the to the website and you know and interacting and and helping me build a great community uh, here on the internet. So thank you guys for that. I really appreciate it. And I will see you soon with the next group of evaluations for the website subscribers. <laughs>